on the plane from London yesterday. Um, they ran out of um, some of the, uh, the food and drink that they were providing for us, and uh, they made this announcement. We apologize in advance if we cannot facilitate your personal request, which I think means we're sorry if we don't have what you want, <laughs> and which suggests that Aer Lingus need either a style guide or uh, a course, as offered by the excellent organization that organized this event. Um, but um, you know, because you're here, you know that's the kind of thing that uh, we are up against. Um, I'm David March. I've been a journalist for about 40 years. That's me earlier in my career on the left. <laughs> the, um, more recently, I wrote this book for Who the Bell Tolls, Central Entertaining Guide to Grammar. It's been out for a couple of years, so you can probably get it on eBay for a, a euro or so. Um, if you do, don't email me and say, it should be for whom the bell tolls. That's the joke. <laughs> um, now, here's a, here's a man. Uh, it's not just me saying that we have to be um, plain and clear in our use of language. Style to be good must be clear. Clearness is secured by using words that are current and ordinary. That's what uh, Aristotle said. A man named C.P. Scott, who was the um, editor of the Manchester Guardian, as it then was, for 60 years, from 1870 until 1930, um, shortly before I joined the newspaper. Um, well, um, there's, an there's a biography of him that says this about Scott, and you'll see the relevance, I hope. Since the paper, the Manchester Guardian, was critical, independent, and in frequent opposition to popular opinion, he felt that everything should be done to make it clear to the average man and woman. It was to appeal to the intelligent rather than to the erudite. He tried to keep out of it the pedantic and obscure, pretense and ostentation. He liked plain English. He constantly asked the question, what does it mean? Or what does he mean? And um, I kind of like to feel, I'm very proud to say that I I'm trying to carry on that tradition in my work at the paper. And I can assure you that when I sit there editing with my colleagues, and we see some of the stuff that the reporters come out and we think, what does he mean? What does she mean? Um, now, what is a style guide? That's what I'm here to talk about. Coco Chanel the, with the cigarette hanging out of her mouth there on the left. Very stylish lady said, fashion fades, only style remains the same. Um, the style guide, I'll tell you a couple of things that I think it isn't first, um, an excuse for not thinking. If you can read that bit that's highlighted, there's a... This newspaper had, this, like The Guardian actually, had the style that if you put a, 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 a sum of money, you translate it into the local currency. <laughs> so the, 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 so the wrap of 50 cent is translated into 1.5, whatever the currency is, renminbi. Um, there was, and uh, I remember years ago we were taught, if somebody says, I feel like a million dollars, don't put in brackets. Six hundred thousand pounds, please. But the point, the point is, what what they've done here is they, they they know what the style is, and they're not using their brains. So they you don't always want to do what the style guide says. The other thing about it, um, here the, uh, the 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 person in the cartoon think uh, says, "I feel good." That doesn't sound grammatically correct to me. I better change it to "I feel well." And lay lady lay should be lie lady lie, and the who is that right? Aren't they the who? In other words. They've been straight jacketed into thinking, I've got to get this into, into style, and they've completely sort of lost, lost the point. And it isn't about whatever kind of style guide you're using for your organisation or your publication. It is not about getting everyone to write exactly the same. There are newspapers, and um, if I mentioned, say, The Times um, in London, I think it's, it's guilty of this. The stories all read as if they were written by the same person. Well, that's not what you're trying to achieve. You want to allow your writers to express themselves, um, but equally you want them to do it in the style of your publication. So it's not a straight jacket. So what is it? Well, here's my uh, uh, attempt at a definition, a set of guidelines for a publication or organisation to enable it to achieve clear, coherent and consistent communication. And as the meerkat said, simples. Um, <laughs> And I think there are other definitions, but that's a reasonable uh, aim. You're talking about 
it doesn't matter whether they're online or in print or however they are, you are talking about guidelines for people when they communicate on behalf of your organisation or within the organisation when you're writing to each other, when you're sending each other an email, when you're addressing the public, and particularly then it's about um, being consistent and about being coherent and above all about being clear. It's about communication, it's not about straitjackets and rules. The Guardian Star Guide, as I mentioned, C.P. Scott was the editor. The, the one on the far right there, that little book, Star Book of the Manchester Guardian, came out in 1928. That was the very first one. Then we've got uh, several books at about approximately 10 year intervals. And these were aimed at the staff of the paper to get them to uh, write in the manner I've just described. Um, the two on the far left are ones that we actually printed as books and published and sold to the public because it was felt that there was, well, to be blunt, because when Lynn Trust did Eat Shoots and Leaves, People said, oh, there's a market for this kind of book. Let's put yours on the market. And then the most recent version of, is this one, which came out a couple of years ago. It's slightly out of date because we update it all the time because we are online. And the place to read the Guardian Star Guide, or the, please buy the book if you wish, but the place to read the Guardian Star Guide, if you want to know what our style is, is uh, theguardian.com slash style guide. Uh, which is online, I update it nearly every day because there's always some new thing in the news that we need to decide. Do we, is it IS or ISIS or ISIL? What do we call them? Um, uh, some new crisis somewhere in the world. How do we spell the local capital? All that sort of thing. So we're updating it for our use all the time. You won't need to do that, I hope, with your, with your guides, but you probably should be updating them every year or so as the language changes and you think of new things to put in. Um, so we're essentially an online guide now, but we do have printed, uh, a printed guide available. Um, I, at the moment, we've also got a Twitter feed um, called uh, uh, Guardian Style, as you can see there, with uh, 60,000 followers. That's a lot of followers for something like a style guide. And these are one or two tweets that I liked. Um, somebody tweeted, initial date finding criteria. Do they smoke? Do they have kids? Do they follow Guardian Style? And we've been called the voice of reason in an illiterate world. And just to, to show that it's not all good, somebody said, the fact that Guardian Style thinks it's the last word on grammar shows extraordinary arrogance from the Grauniad. And for those of you who don't know, the Grauniad is a, a nickname for the Guardian, uh, suggesting that we make a lot of spelling mistakes, which is completely unfair. Um, <laughs> but I, it's, I have been quite often, as, as my role is to make sure that we don't make those mistakes, I've quite often been introduced as, as functions as uh, this is the man who uh, is responsible for the spelling mistakes in the Guardian. In the Guardian. Anyway, so we get a lot of uh, traffic on Twitter and uh, Facebook and uh, it's, it's using social media to do what we've always done, which is, is uh, seek to um, establish clear um, uh, communication through our writing and through our journalism. And uh, we'll use whatever it takes and Twitter has proved a very good means to do that. Um, I think there are five elements a style guide, other people may think there are fewer or more. Uh, anyway, the first one is grammar. He's saying, all we do is fight what's happening to you and I, and she's saying, but sweetie, it's not you and I, it's you and me. And of course, at the bottom it says, why editors have no friends. <laughs> all, the th all the elements of this cartoon ring true in my life. Um, I don't know about yours. But, um, of course, she's being grammatically quite correct. And we think that in a guide, you, I'm, I'm not suggesting that you need to fill it with a lot of uh, uh, rules, particularly the, the old-fashioned kind of rules that make no sense and aren't rules at all, such as not splitting infinitives, ending sentences with a preposition, that sort of thing. It's all nonsense, really. We don't mean that. But we do mean um, there, are, there are areas where you want to be absolutely clear that uh, you're grammatically correct because it's giving you credibility um, with your audience. So you and me, not you and I, unless it's the subject of the sentence, of course. But let's not get too bogged down. Let's talk about syntax. This was on, on our website, Determined Koala Chases Woman on a Quad Bike. Now, <laughs> the biggest... That is the actual koala. The biggest... The biggest problem with, uh, with, com with communication, I think, the, the single biggest thing that, that we have with, when we're editing copy for the newspaper is the syntax. People put the stuff in the wrong order. That's all syntax means, just the um, structure of the sentence, putting the clauses um, in the right order. Now, this is a tricky one because it, it, the woman was on a quad bike, one assumes. So woman on a quad bike makes sense, but it just unfortunately sounds as if the koala was on the quad bike. 
And um, there are ways of rephrasing that. Sometimes you just have to rewrite it when you realise when. In this case, hundreds of people all over Twitter are saying, look what The Guardian's saying about this incredible koala. <laughs> Grammar and syntax. Um, number two, punctuation. This, is, this particular example of punctuation is about the Oxford comma. If you read it, you'll see that uh, Merle Haggard, the country singer, used to be married to Chris Christopherson and Robert Duvall. Keep reading. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, are there any Americans here? Yes, I know there are. Now, you love the Oxford comma, in, in, which is the last comma in a, before the and in a list. Now, in, in the UK, we tend not to use it so much. It's very optional. But there are cases where you need it. So you need a comma. It's a, an Oxford comma or a serial comma after uh, ran, for example. Or uh, the last sentence, you probably need to completely have a completely new think about. <laughs> you need um, a comma after Christopherson and so forth. So, I mean, punctuation, I'm a real stickler for. I, I, I've started a thing called International Apostrophe Day. It's the fifth annual International Apostrophe Day, I think, next week. Um, it's always towards the end of September. And um, because it can change the meaning, I think punctuation is really, really important. And it's something that people struggle with. So we have a, a, a fairly comprehensive punctuation section. Words and spelling. Um, no, Winnie the Pooh very honestly said his spelling was wobbly. Uh, his spelling wobbles and he gets, he probably had the right letters, but uh, not in the right order. Um, spelling's quite difficult. In, I don't know about the people who aren't native English speakers. In English, spelling is very difficult. Now, you're very fortunate. Sometimes when I do a talk, I actually give a spelling test to people. And these are some of the things that we have in the spelling test. You're actually seeing the answers rather than the questions, because these are difficult words to spell in English, in my view. Or the spelling changes the meaning because effect when you use it, which is uh, normally um, a verb is very different from the effect of something as a noun and people mix them up all the time. I still think desiccated should be spelt with two S's and one C despite the fact that it isn't. Um, every time I write about, use the expression fine tooth comb, people argue on social media, is it fine tooth comb like that or is it actually a fine tooth comb to which I say, that is absurd. You, there is no such thing as a tooth comb. Um, <laughs> phased or phased. These are all, I mean, the point about this is, the reason why I would include this sort of thing in a style guide is, if you say that you're phased, if you say that, the, that something's going to be phased in, which, which was with a PH, and you spell it with an F, and said, you look very silly, and you can also change the meaning of, of, um, uh, of uh, when you get these words mixed up. Sometimes words, it's, I mean, you can't really teach spelling, you just have to learn it. So sometimes um, you can, there are aid memoir, a man named Fuchs, uh, the future is named after, so that's a difficult word to spell, but not if you remember that it's named after a man who spelled his name, F-U-C-H-S. Um, everyone thinks just desserts has got two S's in it, as you can see from the cartoon, because desserts, as puddings, do, does have but just desserts as in getting your re uh, reward for doing something wrong. Uh, it comes from des aviers in French and so forth. I can't spell manoeuvring even when I see it like, spelt correctly like that and so forth. Spelling is very important. You'll see later what happens when you misspell the meatloaf's name, the singer, the uh, musician, singer. Um, then we have factual information in our guide um, because uh, sometimes you need to understand the difference between, uh, between facts so that you get them right. So we, for example, adrenaline with a capital A is something different. It's a trademark, in fact, uh, than, the, than adrenaline with a lowercase a. Chaos theory isn't really about chaos. Eskimo or Inuit doesn't have any more words for snow than English does, but you always see this cliche, the Eskimo have all these words for snow. Complete nonsense. Moby Dick has a hyphen in it when it's the title of the book, though actually in the book the whale doesn't have a hyphen in it. Uh, the members of uh, One Direction, now sadly defunct boy band, uh, I'll spell their names like that. And Zigga Zigga is there because I get asked the most strange things and somebody said, we're writing about the Spice Girls. 
And um, this phrase of theirs, how do you, is it, is that, you know, how do you spell Zigga Zigga? So we did a lot of research and came up with that. And by the way, E.E. <laughs> e. Cummings is there because that's how he wrote his name with two capital E's and the fact he didn't use capital letters in his poetry, which is very commendable in my view because as you will hear in a minute, I'm not very keen on capital letters. Nonetheless, he didn't write his name with two lowercase e's, so uh, you spell it with two capital e's. Th those sorts of facts. Um, and then values. This is probably the most important single thing. You're talking about the values of your um, organisation. Now, The Guardian, we regard ourselves as a liberal, uh, left of centre newspaper, um, and we uh, try very hard not, not uh, to think about not writing in a racist or sexist or ageist way or any other ist. Um, I've included these pictures of the sun because um, when writing about mental health, newspapers often get it wrong and the sun's first edition on that notorious occasion was bonkers Bruno locked up, that was Frank Bruno the boxer. And then even the sun realised that um, by a later edition that you don't say bonkers in the 21st century and changed it to uh, San Bruno in mental home. We said, um, in The Guardian, we said on the front page, she's five foot two, she's a grandmother and she earns 25 million a year. I think that's patronizing to older people, patronizing to women, and just generally not good. So uh, we try not to do that sort of thing. Um, every man for him or herself is a, is a reference to the fact that in English you don't have a neutral pronoun, so um, and we don't want to, uh, third person pronoun, so um, the tendency has been when writing about people generally to always use the male pronoun um, and uh, I think that these days women are entitled to something a bit better but it's hard because there isn't really a, an equivalent in English to what you have in some of the languages. We're tending to use the plural so we, will, we, would, um, we would say uh, people are doing it that's, for themselves rather than himself or herself. Um, we've, been, we've been wrestling recently with um, how to refer to uh, migrants, refugees in the current crisis in Europe and um, on the whole we call them refugees because the British press tends to rather demonise migrants and say we're being invaded by these migrants and um, we tend to favour refugees or some similar term. And then I mentioned suicide because writing about suicide is a very sensitive area and you might have to do it. I don't know, it depends on the kind of organisation you have, but even if you're just putting out an announcement about somebody who's a, a, a staff member who's killed themselves, there are ways to do it and there are ways not to do it. So I think this is something that's, which you sort of have guidelines on. And of course, wheelchair bound is, a, is an old fashioned phrase to, um, to refer to wheelchair users that we wouldn't use. So the, there could be a completely different set of things that you want to give guidance about, but it's about the values of your organisation and how you want it to, to come across. So I think that's, that's really important for us, and um, I imagine for you as well. Why, why does it matter? Um, well, I said knows its stuff. <laughs> On the left there, um, but on the right, there's a sort of bl there's a blunter version. It's a serious point, though, because I mentioned punctuation. If you put the apostrophe in the wrong place in the word your, that's what happens. So you need to look professional and to know what you're doing. These pictures I surreptitiously took because they don't allow photography in my local Tesco, which is the biggest, not just the biggest supermarket, the biggest retailer in the UK, and they don't know that there's no such word as men's or unless you put an apostrophe in it. I think that's really sloppy. This company has a turnover of billions. They've got, uh, they send their people um, to business school. Um, they pay them very, very handsomely at the highest level and they don't know simple matters of punctuation. How can you expect children to learn it if uh, they go around the shop and they see that sort of thing? It's just awful and it's so easy to correct and get right. Uh, Tesco's shown no, in I've tweeted these pictures many times, Tesco's shown no inclination to correct them. Sainsbury's, on the other hand, changed theirs and now get them right, which is, uh, which is good, you can make progress. I think um, these people are singing from the same hymn sheet in the English idiom and I think they're, ha they're, they're happier if, if, you, if, if, you're if you're in the communications business or if you're communicating at all, it's good for that your people 
to, uh, to feel confident about the, what the, the, the way you're putting your message across. Um, and it's also important for the public. Now, these scare quotes, we call them squats. Now, the people of Sellersburg, I imagine, thought that they were emphasizing how great it was that they got the former president there. But what scare quotes do is make it look like he's not actually entitled to that description. Um, so best avoided. Um, so really, it's about, you want to come across as, it's not, if you're going to communicate with people, they've got to think you're credible. They won't think you're credible if you do silly things like that. Now, the reason for the AirGrid logo here is uh, partly because they've actually sponsored, I've never been sponsored before, they have sponsored my trip here, which is very kind. Anybody from AirGrid actually here? It's a wonderful, yes, thank you very much. Um, a wonderful organisation. I only wish I could get my electricity from them, but at the moment they don't, uh, they don't cross the Irish Sea, sadly. I put it on there not because they sponsored me, but because that logo is fine. Um, it's all in capital letters. The G is a bit bigger than the rest of it. Now, when you write that, are you in, in, a, in a piece of copy or in, in, when you're referring to the organisation, how are you going to write it? I assume you write it capital E, lowercase i, r, capital G, lowercase r, i, d. Now, you need to make sure that if you're working for them, that that's how you do it and that you all do it like that. And it sounds such an obvious thing, but believe me, we've got people at The Guardian who don't know what our style is for writing The Guardian. Um, and if the very first thing on every style sheet is how do you spell your own organisation? How are you going to... How are you going to set it out? Um, did I want to say? Oh, before, I, yeah. Um, before we talk about that, this plane. I'm not totally sure about that, whether that should be all in caps like that. I think I'll let them off. I think you know because um, I don't like all capital letters. They're, they're a bit shouty, but it is a logo, and it's quite effective. So okay, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll we'll allow that one. Um, this man is uh, an actor who played LSD character in the producers, and I put it there because um, what are the th I believe that this, your organisation, and it's very good advice, think about uh, things in those terms. We've spoken quite a bit about the language of the style guide, the structure. Well, you can do it um, in various ways. You can just have a big, long alphabetical list. That's what we do. If you look at the Guardian style guide, it's like a dictionary. It starts at a, and it finishes at, uh, I think it was Lottie, um, but anyway, it finishes, at, it finishes at Z. Or maybe you want to have sections um, starting with how to spell your own organisation. Um, then the most important things, things pitfalls to avoid. Um, and uh, the HMIC in the UK, which is Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, do a style guide and they have a wonderful section called Jargon Buster. Uh, this is for police officers. And police do have a tendency to use a lot of jargon. They call, instead of calling people men and women, they call them males and females. And they talk about, I was proceeding down such and such an address at such and such time. They've, they've got into the habit of, and this Jargon Buster helps them to speak more plainly and not to fall into those traps. So there are various ways you can set it out. Similarly, um, this is a pretty thick book. Um, we've got the online guide has got hundreds and, well, actually several thousand entries. And you can find your way around quite quickly because you can browse online. You might just, want to, you might just start with an A4 sheet, just of the single most important things that your people need to know. Or a, a few sheets stapled together. Or you could do something loose leaf like this, which you can add to, this is an old Guardian style book, it's not actually very good, but it, um, what we did with it was, or what they did with it was put it into a loose leaf form so you could add bits to it and from it. It will vary depending on the kind of organisation you are, how many people you want to reach, whether it's going to be thick, thin, and you can develop it over time. But I would start with the most important things. What mistakes are people making? What points are they missing? Uh, when they write about your uh, organisation or they write in your publications and get those set out first, get those across to people so that they're starting to seek from the same hymn sheet, as I say. And that is a, a, the URL of our guide, the Guardian Com. Well, actually, you don't need to type a Guardian Observer Style Guide anymore. You can just type Guardian Style and it will take you to... Uh, you can go through it. Design, again... 
You can have a fancy website designer, we have lots of those. Um, or you can just type it out yourself. The most important thing is to get the, the message um, out there. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more practically. How am I doing for time? Fine. I've got 10 things that, uh, to, for you to think about that, uh, about communicating and that should be in every guide. Um, uh, yes, know your audience. That's springtime for Hitler being performed in the producers again. Um, have they shocked their audience there? You need to, you need to be aware of who you're, you're writing for. I was talking to a, a very nice Canadian uh, lady last night at dinner, and she was talking about how um, a publication that they do in the insurance for the insurance company that she works for. Now that's going to contain certain technical items about insurance, um, which um, need to be uh, explained clearly. Um, but you wouldn't put those in uh, in the Guardian style guide. That's too specialised. So you need to be absolutely aware. Are you writing for? Young people, everyone, uh, experts. You just need to be absolutely clear that who you're thinking you're thinking about. We started doing this just for journalists working for the Guardian. Now I'm thinking this is being looked at by people all over the world. What sort of uh, message are we getting across to them? So I'm trying to pull off the, the two tricks there. But you need to think about who you're trying to reach. Uh, use plain language, obviously very relevant to us here today. I can't think of any reason why you would ever say in English resides when you can say lives prior to when you can say before commence instead of start, purchase instead of buy or obtain instead of get. These are just words that are usually used by people trying to sound impressive. Um, I noticed last night before, I mean, it was a lovely tour last night and I don't want to be too critical but I noticed before we went round the uh, the distillery last night, they said that the tour will commence at 8 o'clock. It just sounds a little bit official, it sounds a little bit off-putting to people. You wouldn't say that when you were talking to your friends. You would say, that, when are we going to start? You don't say, unless you're being ironic, when's this talk by David Marsh going to commence? It's just awful. So, there's a, so when I talked about jargon, I think there's, there are any number of these, these are just five off the top of my head, but there are any number of these where you think there's nothing to be gained by using the more complicated word. And there's C.P. Scott, the man I was talking about earlier. One of his great acts, uh, a legendary in the sub-editing community, was that he changed the phrase seaward journey to the great metropolis to voyage to London. Good for him. Um, I'm not, I don't need to... S <laughs> All I will say about this is... You know, you sometimes see in films when they go and pitch an idea for a movie and the producer's sitting there and the writer is saying, and then you're on this plane. All they had to do was say, snakes on a plane. <laughs> we'll make that film. Be concise. It's, it's, I'm right, aren't I? It's so, it's so effective. Um, uh, the, uh, I love the way the, the guy is saying, uh, he's saying, which bit of your fire don't you understand? We brought you in because some people couldn't quite understand personal realignment and downsizing. It's a euphemism for sacking people, and businesses do that sort of thing, and it doesn't help when you're being fired, and it's just an awful thing, euphemism. You're just, you know, it, it, it's the enemy, one of the biggest enemies of, of plain language. Clichés and jargon, I'm showing the Prime Minister because politicians are among the worst offenders for this. In the UK, over the last two elections, all we've heard about um, from politicians is first the phrase, hard-working families. They're not interested in people like me who don't work very hard, or people who don't have a family. They're only interested in hard-working families, and then they come out with drivel like people want fairness and real change, change that will make a difference. <laughs> business people, business people, uh, will we'll say th this is a, a slogan for a company this is actually the company's I don't know what they do but their slogan is delivering actual insight in a multi-channel world it's in their offices in, in London the word delivering and deliverable and deliver is to be avoided in fact it should be excised from the dictionary never mind your guide never say delivering um, it's an awful thing that businesses 
do. Um, and then I don't want to be too hard on the estate agents, but uh, real estate people, you might know them as. This was from my local paper, The Delightful Gardens that adjoin this property are without doubt one of its most redeeming features. That's not how you use the word redeeming, by the way. At measure approximately 0 0.75 acres in total. It's, it's, it's got a nice big garden. Um, <laughs> we talked earlier. We talked earlier about when you need to put a comma in. This one needs to come out. So important punctuation because it can change the meaning. Um, this one, she finds inspiration in cooking her family and her dog. And, and only last week we got a story from Associated Press that said um, we interview a lion hunting dentist without an, without a hyphen, and it's so. Uh, we thought, well, they found a they found a lion to interview. Excellent. I'm not a huge fan of hyphens, but you need one there. So it's, it's punctuation is just so important. Um, capital offenders. Um, now that's how medieval monks did it. Wonderful capital P there. It's actually from uh, the, the Galatians in the New Testament. That's Paul, Paul, the P of Paulus. That's all very well. But and um, I've mentioned plain there. I mean, it's fine. But on the whole, organisations that use capital letters a lot are trying to make themselves look more important and it doesn't really work. And you will see all the time uh, press releases from a company in which they say, we're, we, we're doing this and this, our company with a capital C. Um, or politicians will do it. They'll, you know, I am the, the party spokesman on such and such an, an, an issue and they, they'll capitalise the word spokesman, they'll capitalise the thing. It's just not necessary. You should go through everything that you read um, and say, do we really need these capital letters? Um, spelling, well, this is what Meatloaf had to say about people who spell his name wrong. You can see he's pretty angry. <laughs> you must always check the spelling, of course, and don't necessarily rely on a spell checker to do it. I mean, it, they help, but they sometimes get things wrong. Um, this was a great mistake in the Times a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago. First non-Catholic Pope. <laughs> it's often, it's often really obvious things like that that you don't spot. Um, you know, the, 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 it's really easy to make stupid errors like that. I have sympathy with them because, you know, you're writing at speed against a deadline. Obviously, they meant non-Italian, but it's a very embarrassing thing. So you need to kind of, even you know, even things like spelling your own organisation. As I said earlier, it's so easy to to do things in a hurry and get them wrong. And then that was the BBC. Now, if there's one word you don't want to misspell, it's hadron, and they misspelled it. I'm suggesting. I think if, if they'd read that out loud to themselves before they put it up. Um, and I think it was, uh, I can't remember, a writer, I think it was Von, uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Somebody said that they always uh, read, read their work out loud to, so that they uh, find out the bits that they're skipping and then they can cut those out because they don't want the readers skipping those bits too. But I think that um, I encourage uh, our sub-editors to, if not necessarily all be shouting out, all the time, but when you read stuff, particularly if you've made a lot of changes to something, just to make sure that it makes sense and there aren't any obvious mistakes in it. So those are all kind of ideas that I think that if, if I were starting out from scratch and, and writing in a new guide, the kind of things I'd want to put in there. People say, what's your favorite entry in your own guide? This is probably this one. Uh, I mean, that's, those, that's Sisters of Mercy there on the right, by the way. Um, I just think these distinctions are quite nice and um, it's not the most important thing, but something that we're, we're pleased that we make those little distinctions. I don't... Um, now, this is an excuse to show you a picture of my three-year-old son, Freddie. 
Um, but it's also just to keep things into um, in perspective. The, the great cognitive linguist Stephen Pinker said, style guys are all very well style manuals. Um, and he's right. I mean, Stephen Pinker doesn't like style manuals very much. He think, and the people who write them, uh, he thinks that we're too, we're too keen to just do that straitjacket thing that I spoke about earlier. And um, he has a point, but I agree with him that uh, if you listen to children and how they acquire grammar, you realise that you can't necessarily capture it all in a style guide. And I think he was thinking about the, the child who um, said, um, Daddy, what did you bring that book up that I don't want to... Uh, what, what did you bring that book that I don't want to be read to out of up for? It's a perfectly grammatical sentence. It's got seven prepositions in a row at the end of the sentence. And there used to be this rule, there used to be this rule uh, in English grammar, oh, you can't end a sentence in a preposition. Well, there's seven. And Pinker makes the point that you couldn't teach the child something like that. It's just completely instinctive. And a lot of uh, language is. And we can't uh, capture that all in a, in a guide, as I say, but we can help people quite a lot by setting stuff out to enable them to communicate more clearly. Um, if people would like uh, any tips from us on how to go about this, if you don't have a guide and you're thinking of doing it, a couple of points. First of all, steal from us, and I mean that quite sincerely. I was saying at dinner last night, Star Guide, can, there's no such thing as plagiarism in the world of the Star Guide. We want people to copy our style. I've got uh, publications all over the world that have been in touch and said, we don't really have the resources to do our own style guide. Can we use the Guardians or can we use part of the Guardians? So have a look at our guide and see what you like the look of and help yourself. But more practically, uh, my email is david.marsh at theguardian.com. If there's anything that you want to ask, not necessarily today, but that comes to you that you think we might be able to help with, very happy to oblige, I've got a, uh, now, I've recently been given a team of people working on our style guide, including one in New York and one in Sydney, because we're now a global newspaper with huge readerships in uh, Australia and America and elsewhere in the world. So we have the resources to help if you've got a particular style issue, or come onto Twitter and uh, be like everyone else says, um, ask a question and we'll see if we can we can help you with it and i'll also staying on for the session later i think there'll be a chance to answer some questions so if you've got specific questions for me i'll try and help with those too i don't think i've got anything to add except i did promise to um last night i said i'll be i'll be telling a grammar joke tomorrow so come and hear it if you come for no other reason and i believe that you can use humor to to get the message across and there's Quite a few jokes in my book. Um, which one? Uh, okay. Um, the past, present, and future walked into a bar. It was tense. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's my time up. I've finished. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, th thank you, David. Donald Bergen uh, from the uh, Health Information Equality Authority here in Ireland. Uh, sh short of throwing that heavy book at people, David, how do you enforce your house style in The Guardian and how would you advise others to try and get people to use it and how do you deal with repeat offenders who just don't or won't? Thank you. Well, actually, how did you know that we throw things at them is my, first, is my initial response. Um, it can be frustrating. Um, it's sometimes like herding cats. Um, I'm very fortunate we've got a, w well over 100 sub-editors, and they're all comp sub editors love style. They're all completely signed up to it, um, and they are the enforcers. Um, we try to get the writers on board. Um, many of them are. They appreciate having a guide too. It is the case that there are some who uh, either are, because it's a, a kind of radical organisation, there are people who are rebellious and they don't particularly feel like conforming to style, even though they know we're going to change it. 
If they want to capitalise the P and the M in Prime Minister, they will do so, and then we will take it down and make it lowercase p and M, but they're happy because they wrote, the, wrote it the way they wanted to write it. Um, but I think, on the whole, you try and take people with you. Um, they recognise, I think all journalists on any publication uh, realise that uh, you can't have a completely chaotic publication where everyone's spelling things different ways and writing things different ways. So they are all at some level signed up to it. There are those who um, are more signed up to it than others, and then we do have um, enforcers, as I say. And then sometimes we change it. I sometimes uh, realise I my most embarrassing um, thing, I decided one day that let's not say aeroplane anymore, let's say airplane. Everyone understands airplane. Um, there's a great funny film called Airplane. Let's do this. I did it and I was practically, you know, you, you know, I was, I, I was being subject to the most violent <laughs> attacks from my colleagues, from the public. The in English readers in the UK did not like Airplane, so I had to change it back. And you have to admit you're wrong. You have to admit you're wrong sometime. Um, but on the whole, they're pretty good. And I think that you would find in any organisation, people will support this. They, they, if, you, if you explain the need for it, um, then it's just a question of keeping them on board and uh, reminding them uh, and, and just and also making sure that you've got confidence in your guidelines. Uh, because as I say, if you've got something wrong, then you suddenly realise that they're, they're not going to pay any attention to to what you're trying to get them to do. Does that help? Okay. Sorry? One very quick one. Oh, okay. I'm very past the time now. Put your hand up if you want the one that Yeah, Grace. Sorry. <coughs> Thank you. I'd like to ask you, how, what advice would you give to someone who wants to convince an organisation to make their own style guide? Um, well, um, I, I can't see... I don't know what organisation we're talking about. I can't see why they wouldn't. Um, it, it's... Money. Um, politics. OK. Politics. It's a very political issue mm. on how people write. True. Well, I mean, would they rather have everyone kind of making up their own, doing it their own way, or having some kind of coherent strategy for it? I would have thought that there are... You, the, the, on the money issue, you don't need a, 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 you don't need a lot of resources. I mean, you need you need. Even I don't do this all the time. I'm one person, and I do have some help, as I've mentioned. But I have another job. I'm the production editor. It's not just about enforcing the and, and updating the star guide. So I don't think resources need to be an issue. But I also think if it's a commercial organisation. I'd say to Tesco, if you're, if, you be, if you're getting your style wrong, if you're making these mistakes, you, you're in danger of losing business. I go to Sainsbury's rather than Tesco, primarily because they don't put the apostrophes in the right place. <laughs> how many more people, how many more? Uh, uh, so I think, there are cons I think there are commercial arguments for getting a consistent style because it makes you look more professional and what organization would want to look disorganized um inaccurate shambolic ultimately um i think that unless they actually want to come across in that way they you know just keep banging away at them and say look this will this will make a difference it will make us a better organization i mean i'm sure all of us because we're here at this conference which is about clear communication there are so many benefits of doing it, and there's, there's no downside. I, nobody would want to say, surely nobody would say, uh, well, it's good to uh, send out confusing, conflicting messages to the public, and it's good for our organisation if we all uh, spell words in a completely di different way and so on. It, it can't be. So it's, it, it's, it's important to get the message across. The single most important thing, I suppose, is you're not doing it for the sake of it. You're not just doing this so that you can say, oh, ev everything's neat and tidy, isn't it wonderful, because you're a bit anally retentive, which I am and which star guide editors tend to be. It's not for our benefit. Ultimately, it's for the benefit of the people that you're trying to communicate to.